to our afternoon keynote. For those of you who do not know Dr. Robert Fullylove, then you are in for a special treat. For those of you who do know him, it's going to be even more extraordinary because this is someone who just keeps getting better and better. He always has his finger on the pulse of the nation and the globe. And we are delighted that today, I don't have to read his bio because it's in the program and it's very long, but he's gonna be speaking on the school to prison and school again uh, pipeline and talk about his really humanitarian mission. Thank you so much. Without further ado, the one, the only, the beloved, Dr. Robert Fully Love. My ego is already out of control. <laughs> so, again, because uh, I was trained for the ministry, I often think that my voice carries when it really doesn't. Part of what I was saying is that uh, one of the experiences of coming to this conference is it seems that there are always challenges. This morning, I looked out the window and said, oh my God, they're going to have a hard time filling the halls, but here you are. So very glad to see you. This is about education, and this is about what is, for me, the link between education, mass incarceration, the impact that that has on public health, and the things that we're going to do to do something about it. January 24th of this year was my 25th year as a member of the faculty of Columbia University. And I'm very pleased about the fact that I started teaching here at Teachers College before I actually started teaching at the Mailman School of Public Health. And it's always been really important for me, since I have an EDD, to be in the presence of folk who really understand education and see this as, to this day, the way in which many of the issues that we confront as a nation are going to be resolved. In addition to uh, having just celebrated a momentous anniversary that suggests that my time at Columbia has been pretty long and uh, pretty interesting, there's also the fact that in July of 2014, last year, I celebrated my 50th anniversary as a classroom teacher. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm that old. In July of 1964, I was part of Mississippi Freedom Summer. Some of you are actually old enough to know what that was about. I was a field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and I started teaching in one of the freedom schools in Holly Springs, Mississippi, in Marshall County. I'm one of the folk who stayed with SNCC, so in 65, I was in Adams County in Natchez, doing the same kind of thing. And I think for me, the notion that there was something magical about what you could do with education, that there was something magical about the ways in which it had the capacity to transform folks' life, stayed with me to this day. I will never forget what it was like in a backwoods part of Mississippi to talk to African Americans, almost none of whom could read, about the fact that they were actually citizens of a democracy that they had a role to play in the management of the affairs of the nation, and that their exclusion from voting in that state, often at the, the cost of the lives of the black activists who were trying to get people to understand the power of the vote, that their exclusion was going to be something that they would turn around, and in turning around would transform the nature of life in that state. So the fact that uh, fast forwarding 50 years, I'm now in my fourth year teaching in the Bard Prison Initiative, where every Monday morning I get up at 5 o'clock to drive to Woodbourne State Correctional Facility in Sullivan County and talk with a bunch of young men about careers in public health. It's made that over the course of the last half century, I've really come quite a distance. I want to tell you something about why that particular bakul, as the French say, has been so important. Now, for those of you who know who I am, me and PowerPoint, we don't always get along, so let's see how this works. Many of you are here because of what Michelle Alexander is going to be discussing later. And you're here because, like most Americans who watch what's going on in the evolution of our nation, 
you're completely aware of how much mass incarceration has transformed life for so many of us. For those of us who work in communities of color, where on any given day, somewhere between 25 and 35 percent of all the young men between the ages of 19 and 39 might be in prison, in jail, on parole, or under the supervision of the courts, we know how that has transformed American life. And one way of understanding the nature of that transformation is listed right here in this very, very effective graph. You're aware, I'm sure, having uh, kept up with the current discourse on mass incarceration, that as a nation, we are 5% of the world's population, but we incarcerate 25% of the world's prisoners. 5% of the world's population, but this country holds 25% of all the men and women doing time anywhere in the world. Our rate of incarceration is greater than that in China. It's greater than that in the Soviet Union. It makes us unique for a variety of different reasons. This is what it looks like. If you've not been, to be in a facility like this is for many of us, especially those of us who live in New York, very much like being in your neighborhood and having it transformed by barbed wire and bars. Because the folk who were there not only look like us, they are us. Seven neighborhoods in New York City supply somewhere between 45 to 55 percent of the prison population in the state of New York. Seven neighborhoods. Which means that however far away these institutions are, they're part of our community. California, as many of you know, in, 19, excuse me, in 2007 had a court case brought by incarcerated individuals in that state system arguing that their access to health care was hugely, hugely impeded by the fact that overcrowding in the prison meant that they couldn't get to see a doctor in a timely fashion. And when they did, their care was suboptimal. The docs agreed pointing out that overcrowding in the prison meant that waiting times to see a physician had gotten out of hand. And since these are men, and increasingly women, who are drawn from communities that suffer from huge health disparities, folk who come from sick communities are not likely to be healthy at the point that they enter and are very likely to be unhealthy at the point they get out. In talks that I've given at this conference before, I've pointed out that the rates of HIV infection in our systems of incarceration here in the United States are two to three times what they are in the general population. In 1990, at the height of the AIDS epidemic, when the epidemic was making a transition from gay men to become an institution within black and brown communities of color, almost 25% of all the folk living with an HIV infection who were in prison were doing time in a prison in New York State. It's estimated that to this day, every year, one out of every seven persons living with HIV in the United States is going to pass through a jail or a prison. And when you look at images like this, you can imagine the public health, shall I describe it as a dilemma or crisis that's represented by these levels of overcrowding. You have to understand that of all the groups in the United States with an absolute guaranteed right to health care, it's inmates in facilities like this. To deny them health care is basically to subject them to cruel and unusual punishment expressly forbidden by the Constitution. 60% of that population, as you just saw, black and brown. The war on drugs, more than anything else, not only accounts for why so many folk doing time in these facilities are from poor communities of color, it has a great deal to do with why the HIV epidemic in a city like New York has been raging out of control. Again, in a point that I've made in previous talks, recall that although 1981 is the year when we recognized that HIV was in our midst, 1981 was the year that folk at the end stage of HIV disease showed up in a facility and announced their presence. But you know about HIV. It takes, what, 10, 12 years to incubate? During that period of time, folk are, for all intents and purposes, asymptomatic. That means that at the point when President Nixon in 1970 declared a war on drugs, and with the establishment of the Drug Enforcement Agency in 1973, 
as a nation, we started to lock up the group of the, that was at greatest risk for being exposed to HIV. So what does it look like now? One in every three black men in the United States is going to do time in a prison in his lifetime. There are seven states in the United States where one out of four black men has permanently lost the right to vote because that person has been convicted of a felony. When Michelle Alexander will speak, as she does so eloquently, on the new Jim Crow, she's describing the transformation of our communities into places that used to be all about kids and families, into places where people return from prison unable to qualify for housing, for education, or for jobs, where they, for all intents and purposes, have no choice but to go back because there's no way for their, for, there's no way in, in any of the systems that I know about for them to improve the quality of life and their training for the outside world while they're in prison. And as a consequence, our system is dominated by high rates of recidivism. We have 2.3 million people doing time in state and federal facilities in the United States. And roughly one half of those folks have already done time before and they're back because they violated the condition of their paroles, which means that they haven't necessarily committed new crimes. A new report that's just come out from the Brennan Foundation indicates that uh, the drop in crime that we have observed in urban America over the last 10 years is not because of mass incarceration. In fact, they argue that there are diminishing returns that result from locking so many men up. I mean, past a certain point, our war on drugs has meant that we haven't gone after killers. We haven't gone after folk who are violent. We have typically gone after very low-level drug dealers who aren't engaged in either property crime or violent crime, and we fill the prisons with them. So the efficiency of police forces in fighting the real problems that many of us in poor communities face has been dr pretty dramatically hampered because there's so much about getting the crimes that are associated with arresting large numbers of folk who are involved with the drug trade that other issues of community policing typically are lacking. So how does it all begin? A lot of folk have said that if you want to estimate how large the prison population is going to be in a given state, look at the city schools and look at the reading scores in the first, fourth grade. That is a possibly apocryphal relationship that actually turns out to be true. It actually turns out to be true. If you think about the way schools operate, it is at the fourth grade where folk are going to start to make serious moves towards what used to be in my age, junior high, and is now called middle school. If you're not doing well in reading at the fourth grade and you are falling behind in mathematics, for those of you who are teachers, you know what's left. It's at this point that kids who are starting to develop a self-image are going to say, well, maybe I'm not really about school. Maybe school is really not about me. And as a consequence, they look for other ways to develop their sense of self. And for young boys in communities where the young men are already missing, the notion that the role you're supposed to play as an adult male is one where you're going to be part of the system of mass incarceration seems like logic. Those of you who teach in the schools who already know young people who are thinking about when they're going to do time and how well they're going to do it know exactly what I'm talking about. And I see some heads nodding. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. I want to suggest that first off, this begins nationally with the notion that uh, suspension, expulsion, just basically kicking out of schools or arresting them is one of the ways in which this whole process starts. Blacks are 15% of the U.S. population, but 40% of those that are expelled from the U.S. schools each year. They're much more likely to be suspended. And 68% of all the folk who are doing time on the inside, I'm talking now about the males, don't have a high school diploma. The most shocking thing for me is that it becomes clear in our post-industrial society that if you've ever been in a prison, where folk are real clear, it's not cool to be here. I'll do whatever I got to do to get out and stay out. Were they given an opportunity just to up the nature of their credentials and education, they know that that makes it possible for them to think about other options when they get into the community other than going back to the life that they knew. 
it makes a difference if you don't have a high school diploma. You're out in the street, and you're in a community like the one I grew up in, Newark, New Jersey, where in this post-industrial era, there are no jobs for unskilled workers. So you don't have a high school diploma. You basically got a job working for the dope man. You got caught. You got busted. You did a little time. You come back. Why are we surprised that within three to five years, without any training on the inside, 70% of these folks nationwide are going to go back? But the most disgusting part of all this is the way in which, as a nation, we've spent this sum of money on our systems of incarceration. Budgets in some states that for a 20-year period, 20 period grew at the rate of 127% a year, and we've only spent a fraction of that on education just in general in the United States that so many of our urban public schools are dominated by black and brown students who know themselves to be in a setting and in a situation and in a system that's a dead end, makes it very clear that the connection between schools on the one hand and their failure of these students and the likelihood that folk are going to wind up doing time becomes a relationship that becomes clearer and clearer with each passing day. So what about Bard College? I have been working with these folks for the last four years, as I've said. In 1999, Max Kenner, a student at Bard, which is a regular, credited institution, about two hours' drive from here upstate, a Methodist institution, if I'm not mistaken. It's been around for more than 100 years. Max decided that, listen, I'm doing this work with folk who are currently doing time, and I keep thinking that there's a role that the college could play and bringing education to the folks who are in these settings. The Bard Prison Initiative was born, and for the last 15 years, Bard faculty have been teaching regular Bard college courses on the inside to these inmates. They are regular college classes. These aren't classes where folk who are bored come to spend time. You have to take an entrance exam. You have to pass an interview. You have to give a writing sample. It is amazing to conceive of how, when you walk into one of these settings and start to teach classes, you're really dealing with a population that is so hungry for education that for those of you like me who've been engaged in higher education where, for example, you assign 1,000 pages for your students to read, and at Columbia at least, when you come back, they've read the abstract, <laughs> they've done the skimming, they know the topic sentences of worth, and they can fake it very well. In this setting, they've not only read everything, they are eager to tackle everything that's there and confront me about any of the items that they feel may not represent the truth as they understand it. I've described a life where I've spent 50 years as a teacher. This is the first time in many years I've actually felt like one. Where I haven't been dealing with the children of the privileged, <laughs> I've been dealing with folk who are hungry because they know that this is the link that connects them to the outside. And the scariest thing of all is to see the level of talent that is there. The 2015 commencement that was held at Eastern State Correctional Facility in January was one in which 14 men got BA degrees. Six of them did their senior thesis in mathematics on number theory, combinational theory, Hilger's assertion, stuff I've never heard of. <laughs> Those of you who, for example, might have been pre-med and were forced to do a semester of calculus, understand that you were exposed to mathematics as we understood it in the 17th and 18th centuries. To suddenly come up with guys in prison who are looking at modern mathematical journals and can talk knowingly about number theory, prime numbers, combinatorics, I mean, it blows you away. And then it hits you, the tragedy. They're there, not here. They're not in the audience with us. That means that some of the minds that might have transformed the life of the community, that had all the genius necessary to reconfigure the world and alter the way in which young people understand their place in it, those folks are gone. If you looked at the statistics of what it's like to have one in every nine black children have at least one parent who's locked up and you understand how much that's meant for the sanctity of the family in our communities, 
when you see what it means to have so many of the men who could have guided young people into appropriate adult roles in the community, doing time in a setting like this, the tragedy hits you full force. And it hits you in a variety of ways. I have guys who've been locked up since they were 16 and 17 years old who have already done 15 to 20 years and still have another five to go. That means that it's not just a loss that we've observed over the period of that graph from the 1970s to now. It's a, it's a process. It's a trend that's going to continue. And at a point where we really need to be thinking through what it would be like to have men like that back in the community, it's interesting to see what it's like to start teaching college-level courses to a population like this, especially if uh, you do it as I've done it, by focusing on public health. I pointed out that, at least in a couple of, of the publications I've made about <clears throat> the relationship between mass incarceration and AIDS, one of the ways in which you saw the transformation of our communities into places that are epicenters for the HIV epidemic has to be the fact that the adults who would normally have been in communities to help us pull together the necessary components of effective public health prevention programs simply weren't there. So I tell my guys all the time, you need to go back. The missing factor in public health in your communities is you, because you're here, not there. We need you back there. You want to know whether or not there's a role for you? Public health, and this is a term that they use, is felony friendly. <laughs> Those of you who are in places like Sinai, who understand that uh, with the Affordable Care Act, we're doing everything we can to bring in new populations of patients into our health care facilities, you understand better than most that a lot of the folk that we're trying to reach are exactly the folk that I'm teaching on the inside. They've come back home, and they're real clear. They don't want to have anything to do with anything that we are offering them. They'll come to a clinic in a hospital, and as soon as they have to tell the receptionist, well, yeah, I, I, I know my medical records are missing 15 years. It's because I did time in uh, a prison. And then the look on the face of the receptionist is transformed. It's like, oh, you're one of them. There's a certain withdrawal. The body language says it all. You're filling out these questions, but it's real clear. They don't want you here, and they think of you as part of the problem. And as a consequence, it's not surprising that a lot of folk will only, and under extreme circumstance, find their way to health care facilities because they need emergency care. So they are, in many instances, the frequent flyers in many of our emergency rooms. And the fact that they're getting primary care there instead of in the community means that the costs of health care are going up. So the idea that we're now trying to recruit guys like this to serve as liaison between the neighborhoods that they're returning to and the health care facilities that are there is very clearly, <clears throat> for me, an idea whose time has come. Think about it. Think about it. In many of these instances, we're talking not just about outreach to communities that often find that health care and clinical settings are not places to be trusted. These are guys that are trusted, been there, done that, know the community. The ones who have a particular kind of, uh, how shall I describe it, group charisma, are the ones who are in a particularly good position to make the link between health care facilities that have never figured out how to serve this population very well, and not only gaining access to them, but maybe improving the quality of service. Because it's not just they're working with the future patients. They're also working with the staff and with the physicians and with the clinical personnel to say, y'all got to clean this up. Y'all got to do a better job, and here's how it's going to be done. So. I believe that if we're educators, we have a role to play. I think you understand that in 1994, the Congress in its infinite wisdom decided to withdraw Pell Grants from inmates who were doing time in prison and who were getting college courses. They suddenly said, no, it's unfair to deprive the general population of money that should go to deserving students and instead give it to these guys. And the fact that people pointed out uh, no, that's not the way it works. There is no money that's being taken from, quote, deserving college students and being given to inmates. And the amount of money that we're talking about is a fraction, a fraction of that particular federal grant program's money. It's not a significant factor. However, at a point when 
the Congress was all about making a good image and trying to convince the American people that it was hard on crime and protecting their money, protecting their tax dollars. It seemed like an idea, and now we are living with the aftermath. The most important thing about the BARD initiative is that they pay for it out of their own pockets. They are not doing this with grants from the state. In fact, when Governor Cuomo last year at about this time in a speech to the legislature said, listen, it costs us $60,000 a year to lock up a man in a New York State prison facility, but it only costs us $5,000 to provide a college education to that individual. The recidivism rate in the state of New York hovers somewhere between 40 and 45%. The recidivism rate for folks who've gotten a degree on the inside is 4%. Do the math. Do the math. For all the states that struggle to balance their budgets, where the biggest item in the budget is often the budget for their systems of incarceration, where they're basically serving as a revolving door, the idea that this is a way in which you make an investment in the inmate and not in the facility and by transforming the likelihood that the inmate gets out and becomes a contributing member of his community, if it were any other place than the United States, one might imagine that the logic, the rationale behind that would work. But there are a couple of y'all who are chuckling as a, yeah, yeah, good luck on that. <laughs> but the fact remains that uh, more and more colleges and universities are becoming interested in this. And it becomes critically important to understand that uh, Folk who have been a part of BPI and who are finding their way into graduate programs throughout the state of New York are doing very well. Annabelle Cortez, is Annabelle, are you here by any chance? Graduated from the Woodbourne State Correctional Facility and the Bard Prison Initiative Program there, came to the Mailman School of Public Health in 2013 and graduated with an MPH in epidemiology in 2014. Annabelle is working for the Fortune Society. I told the incoming class at Mailman, wait, the time is going to come when I'm going to do what I can, and hopefully it will be a mission that many of you will accept, to make sure that we make something like this training possible. The talent is there, the ability is there, the desire is there, the motivation is there, the need, the need is most especially there. So one way of looking at it is, now you've got to help me out. <clears throat> this is a link to a four minute, 36 second video that describes the commencement address at Woodbourne in May of 2014. The BPI program first started at Eastern approximately 15 years ago. I was there. And I remember some of my friends getting accepted into BPI. I used to see how happy they were to be a part of something meaningful. It changed the whole scope of my incarceration from wasting countless hours a day doing things I shouldn't have been doing to giving me something to focus on and, and concentrate on. And, put my all into. It really hit me that I had to do something, not just so I don't repeat the same mistakes, but so I could contribute to my family, first and foremost, my family and my community. Because I think that's, those are the people who I really need it most, especially since I've been a contributor for the negative effects of our society. What if the solution was the person we thought was the problem? I want each of you to think about the moment you decided to stop sliding, to stop failing, to stop moving sideways, and to rise. You've overcome significant hardships. Some weren't your fault, some were. But the measure of your achievement is the distance that you've traveled since then. Well, my time with Bard has definitely shown me that I am an intellectual. I like scholarly work, I love it, I get enthused by it, I get lost in a new book every time I take it back to my cell and read it. And I look forward to just the pursuit of education and acquisition of knowledge in itself. I was released November 15th of last year. 
Bard College actually helped me transition into CUNY very easily. And I'm on the fast track to get my bachelor's by the spring of next year. Really proud. This is an investment that the entire nation should be making. These guys are going to be problem solvers. And they're going to go back to places where problems abound. The notion that they have a sense of what to do and how to do it, I think bodes well for the future. At my age, for the first time in a lot of years, I uh, consider myself to be an optimist, based entirely on what has happened to me here. Others will tell you how significant our program is, and there's an emphasis in uh, how much we do for you. You ought to know that you do a lot for us. Uh, we live at a time where people don't really believe in education. That doubt uh, is something we struggle with. Your enthusiasm, your determination, your idealism about education gives back to us a reminder of why we should fight for what we do. When I saw my family and I saw the tears and the excitement in their eyes and the words of, of inspiration that they were giving me, it was like, that's when it really hit me. That's when it, I just like, couldn't hold back anymore. There were just tears coming down my cheeks. And it was a really amazing, amazing experience. And I've actually never, never before have cried any tears of joy like that before. And they actually made it possible today. <laughs> yeah. I believe we don't have a single person to waste in this country. And when you look in the mirror, if you still see a person who's the problem, then consider what if the person we thought is the problem is actually the solution? What if the solution is you? I always wondered what it would feel like to be the best in this world. Well, some of the best in this world are here today, and they're my fellow graduates. Some people refer to us as inmates, prisoners, con men, but we are more than these labels suggest. This education, this degree, it symbolizes excellence. Excellence does a birth out of struggle. My struggle, all of our struggles. That's deep, isn't it? <laughs> Every one of the men that you saw speaking has taken a class with me, Introduction to Public Health. And Rich Gamara, the guy who said he got out November 15th and it's finishing up CUNY right now, has just been admitted to the Mailman School of Public Health for a master's degree in epidemiology. He begins in the fall. <clears throat> for a lot of you, none of this is news. You knew that this was out there. You knew that in our communities, we had folk who contained all the elements of greatness, all the possibilities for transforming their communities that so many of them are caught up in this system and are literally being wasted in settings like that is something that I think as a nation we have to come to grips with. What was it that the congressman said? We don't have one single person to waste in this country and that we are wasting so many on something that costs us money and that has no return on the investment that I can see means that now is the time for us to redo our thinking and reimagine the possibilities that those of us as educators are in a unique position to do. More than public health, I believe this is a clarion call for all of us. We started out because we thought there was something about the classroom, something about the educational in enterprise that could really transform the world. That's evidence. That's evidence of that level of transformation. And let's be clear, it's something that each of you might be in a position to become a part of. The need is there, the hunger is there, the desire is there, the possibilities are there. If we take away nothing from this conference other than the notion that one of the ways we can confront health disparities is to rethink our notion about leadership in health education and in public health, thinking about the role that these men will play is something that I commend to your attention as a possibility that is worth our most passionate levels of exploration. Thank you.
Yeah, this time I left enough time for questions. I think that's pretty provocative. And there are questions I would hope you ask about why did we do college, for example, as opposed to basic stuff? I mean, please. Well, yes. I was going, brother. Oh, you're so loud. I'm from Toronto. I want to say thank you. That was all, I'm 19 years old, and like, I was at the risk of being in that situation, too. But I love education. It's like the most powerful thing that happened to me. Uh, my friends from Toronto here, Ramon, Chelsea, Roderick, and everyone else, like, got me involved in the school. I wrote curriculum. It's something I love to see, like, young black men just getting their shit, their shit together, you know what I'm saying? Getting their, friend, getting their feet right. Because I got so many friends in the hoods who just, like, don't see that stuff, don't see it that way. And I try and like, give them to, to them. But that, that was, like, the truth, the Bible. You got to amen. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm just saying, because, like, <laughs> and just, like, me being so young and, like, just seeing things so older than I did, you know what I'm saying? Like, not having a good home, but just, like, you know, having, having a support group. And, like, being in the prison, like, I, I wouldn't want to be there, but I could see why it's such a fruit, like, that kind of a context and make it so fruitful, you know, and so, and so valuable to have people around you who, who want to just get together and do well. Like, community is the big word. Community, I wrote it down, actually. Community is like my biggest word to say every time I go somewhere because it's communal. It takes a village to raise somebody. And I was raised by, you raised me just now. I, I need a lot. You've <laughs> added my, add my upbringing. And I just, like, and I feel like those young men, I've also learned that like, no matter where they go, they're going to be raised and given some kind of knowledge to keep, 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 them, going, going, keep them going forward. Like, just watching that video, man, I, could, I couldn't clap. I wanted to cry. It, was really, like, it got me because I, I have some of my friends who don't see that, and I feel like I can see it. Why, why can't you, man? There's so much power in learning, not being taught. But there's so much power in learning for yourself and about yourself through what you're learning, right? And those guys, they say, I hate books. I say reads books in the cell and gets lost in books. I wish I could do that, you know what I'm saying? But just, I, I, I'm in a better place than they I assume you're talking about being lost in the book as opposed to being lost in yourself. Yeah, 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 because you don't need to go there to read. There's, there's, a, big, there's a big difference. You don't, you don't got to go there to read, but it's a big difference. It's like they, there's nothing yes. to do, and you find so much value in learning yes. education. Yes. I feel like yes. Yes. this conference, this all this stuff, and just like it makes me feel so much better because I'm only 19, and in 10 years I'm gonna have your job, and I'm gonna be doing this, <laughs> and so I have like I have like an upper hand, and like I'm I'm learning early, and I want to thank you so much for that because that was like the truth, my brother. Seriously, I man. love in it. <laughs> in, in, in 10 years, I will be 81. <laughs> I'll be 30. I'll be 30 in, in your shoes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. Much appreciated. Much love. So, so we do the alternate thing? Yeah. Okay. How are you, Dr. Foley Love? It's been a while, you. but you still look young. <laughs> um, I fish for that compliment shamelessly, and I'm so sorry. You know, forgive me. So I just wanted to first just make a statement that one of the ways that our society can overcome the legacy of slavery and um, racism is by doing more to make sure that young people, and particularly uh, young men, are steered away from career, are steered, are steered towards careers and opportunities rather than prison. And I think that you know your presentation really resonates with my experience as an educator. I work for Hostos Community College, where we have a, a program for you know inmates to come, and we receive a lot of students in our community health program. One of the things I just want to say is that. Education or educators also need to be prepared for this incoming population that's going to be coming uh, at larger numbers. One of the impressions that I had last semester was with a student who came to my office for advising, and I said, "You know, where were you before? You know, for a couple of years because you're a new student." He's like, "No, I'm not you. I just I was upstate." And to me, I understood what he meant because I had worked at Rikers, so I kind of understood the lingo. And I said, "Oh, that's great. I worked at Rikers." Automatically, his body language changed. He became more engaged because he came in there with a chip on his shoulder. But I kind of, you know, engaged him by telling him, I understand, but, you know, let's talk about your education. I don't really care about what, why you were upstate, upstate. And he said to me, he's like, you're the only professor that I've encountered my year here at Hostos that really has kind of understood me and I can feel at ease to talk to. Needless to say, he's now at Lehman doing a PhD in mathematics because he was sitting with me saying, I can't do chemistry, I can't do pharmaceuticals because of my background. I said, well, what can you do? He has a 4.0 in math. I said, well, do math. You can get a PhD in math. And, you know, he said, there's, there's possibility for that. So I think when they come out, they're being told all these things that they can't do. And we as educators need to be more, I guess, engaged or more active in how to help this population. Yes, there's these barriers that they may have to deal with, you know, but there's all these other opportunities that are out there for them. And I think that we need to make more um, training in educational facilities um, where professors can be more aware how to be of better service to this population. Because I think that the first reaction they have is a very long-standing reaction and may cause them to walk away. 
And the most important thing, if I can just add to your really excellent commentary, is that it is now increasingly possible, where it wasn't in the past, for someone who is formerly incarcerated to get access to student loans. They're slowly but surely prying their fingers off the vice right. that kept those dollars away. So that means that folk who want to go are increasingly going to go because they will be able to finance it. And everything you said about recognizing that there are different populations, bright but not necessarily able to see the glowing future that many of our other students have and what we can do to make our institutions more welcoming and what we can do to make sure that they promote success is, I think, once again, an idea whose time has come. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to commend you on your excellent presentation. But I also wanted to make uh, note that from your slides, one in three black men are either going to be incarcerated or are incarcerated at this point in time. What are we as a society doing to circumvent that, number one, from a primary level? If we can predict that this is what's going to happen, we should be teaching oppression awareness from the primary level so that we are going to minimize that factor. Are we doing that here in New York City, in the largest city in America? I have never seen it. I'm from Toronto, are we doing that where the stats are pretty much almost the same? Nowhere to be seen. The awareness, the factors that we can bring forth in terms of allowing people to see that the choices or decisions that they make, and also the systemic oppression that makes it more likely that they will fall into those you know, jails or whatever the case may be, we need to give that awareness from early so that people, again, can make choices that they can not necessarily end up where you, you know, have to get an education based on you know, being incarcerated. We have that right to not be incarcerated and obviously to learn. Amen. And I just want to say that part of what students do for my course is they write proposals in which they describe <clears throat> public health interventions or public health research that they'd like to undertake. Almost to a man, folk talk about coming back to the community and setting up something. They have a wide variety of ideas what these would be like, where they would specifically target young people and say, whatever you do, there's nothing glamorous about this. You do not belong here. There have got to be alternatives. Can we work together to find them out? So I want to say that one of the ways in which you reverse the trend is have people who've lived it on the inside get the training necessary to come out and provide the kinds of interventions that achieve the goal that you so eloquently described. I'm with you 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, I want to thank you so much for your presentation and your work. It's extremely meaningful and very um, exciting for me. I'm coming from New Orleans, Louisiana. We incarcerate more people per capita than anywhere else in the world, right? Um, and we also have some of the worst jails. And our local jail, um, I think our biggest struggle is getting in there at all. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how to gain access into a jail that won't let you in. Um, you know, our women's facility doesn't even have a computer, and we can't even get providers to go in for mental health services, substance use services, et cetera. Um, so I was wondering, obviously logic does not work in Louisiana, I'm sure you know. So <laughs> if you could give any insight into how we can gain access to do such a great program for our population who also needs it. Yeah, so, the, of course, the key question. I want to make a distinction between a jail and a prison. A jail is a holding facility. It is not a prison. <clears throat> you go there to be arraigned and held until you have your day in court. Once you have your day in court, if you are found guilty, then you go to a prison, and if you're not, you're sent home. Jails have been places where increasingly departments of health have had a great deal of success screening people for HIV, a wide variety of STDs, tuberculosis, which is a major issue in our home state. I was born in New Orleans in 1944, for what it's worth. And as a consequence, because those are conditions that have the impact that they have in the community, departments of health are often places where you can get access to these facilities. I work at the Department of Health. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm going to be in New Orleans in two weeks. I'm going to be at Tulane. Um. I'll go there with you. Okay. I, I do want to suggest that, you know, of all the folk who uh, might be able to help, Thomas Farley, the former commissioner of health for the city of New York, and the guy who's now, I think, at their school of public health, and uh, he's the, an emeritus professor of public health there, 
Farley used to teach at Tulane. He has a real presence there. I'm still one who believes that the power of both medicine, public health, and higher education institutions to do something, to at least negotiate this, becomes possible. And sometimes the way to do it is with money. Get a grant from the state or from the feds to do screening for STDs. The notion that you can catch a lot of folk at the point, even if it's a jail where they're only going to be there for a couple of days, where you can catch and treat, test and treat, becomes really quite attractive because it does lower health care costs in the community. It is a complex argument to make, but with the Affordable Care Act not being in Louisiana, mm -hmm. this does become one of the ways in which a state that really needs access to health care can start thinking through how to get access to its neediest and, in many respects, its most unhealthy population. I mean, it's, it's an idea that's worth playing with. But try, <clears throat> if I knew how to do this easily, you know, I'd be emperor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, New York State is really quite unusual because it's had a number of commissioners of health in the correction system, I'm thinking about Lester Wright, who were really visionaries. And when it became clear that we had a large number of people living with HIV in prisons in New York, he's the guy who said, look, we've got to clean this up. And he really made it possible for a lot of this work to be done. I want to believe that folk like that, with that vision, who aren't about education or doing good for prisoners, but who are all about improving community health, might have a way of at least getting a toe in the door and from that toe in the door actually expand the nature of their access and the kinds of things that they can do once they're there. Thank you. I appreciate that. I also just want to add, though, because in Louisiana we have such an overpopulation issue in our prison, our jail houses people for years, and they have less resources there. Yeah, and that's one of those constitutional tricks. Remember what happened in California. It was the inmates who bought a class action suit saying that overcrowding means we don't have access to health care. That worked. The state of California, you may know, has been in receivership since 2007, in which the receiver basically is able to comment and direct the expenditures in the State Department of Corrections budget around everything having to do with everything from overcrowding to health care facilities on the inside. The state hates it. And it is so clear that it has turned their Department of Corrections on its year that I believe fear of having that happen in a state that obviously has a history of terrible abuse of its prisoners. I mean, you know, they sing blues about uh, Algeria. What, what's it? Algiers. Angola. Angola. Yeah, I know it was one of those, it, mm -hmm. of all the, one of the names of the worst state prisons. Yeah. Angola. You know, I mean, it's sung up in song and fable. A whole bunch of blues tunes that are dedicated. It's that bad. So the notion that this might be the, the place where a state that can't afford it could suddenly have a class action suit that would dramatically change its budget prospects, I'm hoping that is that kind of menace that will allow them to think if there is an alternative, maybe we should embrace it. It's a guess. Thank One you hopes. so much. Thank Come you. down, hit us up. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Foley Love. It's really an honor to have you talk about this. Um, tangentially, when I think about what happens in the fourth grade educating our students and how that connects to the prison environment, uh, once kids get into the fourth grade, it's about sitting down and taking somebody else's belief system and shoveling that in as fast as we can to these young minds, personal opinion. And anybody who's not going to buy into that program is going to risk being bounced out of the, the dominant uh, social fabric. Yeah. And that's yeah. where that happens in the educational procedure. And uh, for, that, for that reason, I personally took my kids out of the school, my, my male children. I have three, girl and two boys. But what I saw was that there was a place in the curriculum where it went from exploration and a thirst of knowledge and a desire to find out who you are to being programmed. And I see that, I, I know that I'm saying something that's not very politically correct because I think teachers really want to do the right thing, but there's a real emphasis on putting a lot of facts and figures into people's heads from fourth grade forward instead of teaching them to continue to be curious and find out who they really are. And I think that's come tremendously connected to there only being two environments where you have to sit without moving and do what somebody says without asking, and that's in our schools and in our prisons. And there's a, there's a parallel there that's really, really deep. And the second thing I want to just raise to conscious awareness is that 
even inside my own soul, and I consider myself a fairly loving person, I had to fight my own demons about what it means to be a punisher of the people that we've rejected. And our society has a deep, deep sense of punishment of the people that don't fit. And we act that out on the people that are in our prisons. We act that out on the people that want to visit the people in the prisons. We act that out on the people that want to provide food to the people in the prisons or health care to those people. And it is a sickness inside our souls that what you are doing is part of that redemption process, not for the prisoners, but for all of us who are on the outside who are tolerating this. So I just want to personally thank you for the piece that you're playing in saving us. You know, we are, we are punishing people for making mistakes over and over and over again. And we're, you know, the thing about the Pell Grants, well, why should we give money to people or why should we let them walk around outside of a six by six room? There is something inside of us that doesn't have the capacity to understand that people make mistakes and they grow through mistakes. That's how we learn. And so those are the things that I want to just bring up that we're carrying around in a society. We have to heal that inside ourselves or we will continue to put especially the male active members of our society who do not want to bow down and be oppressed into prisons. Well said. One, one point I'd like to add to that that's very critical about educational institutions. In states that are all about no child left behind, teachers are very clear, my pay, my tenure depends on my being able to get the kids in my classroom up to a certain level of learning. If I've got a kid who's acting out and whose behavior is going to ruin the behavior of the class, I've got a lot of motivation to say, take this kid out of here so I can teach the kids who want to learn. A lot of teachers will tell you that, and they mean it, and they're all about the kids who want to learn. The problem is that the overrepresentation of black and Latino kids and the kids who are kicked out or expelled really means that that's where the real problem begins. The other one that I didn't mention is that foster care. 70% of all the folk doing time in state prison in the state of California, for example, are kids who are in foster care. So it's not just what happens in the schools. It's what happens when folk are bounced around from family to family, do not have a consistent school that is their own, struggle to connect and survive, and find that the stuff outside of the school is infinitely more pleasurable and infinitely more engaging. So you're right. It is systemic. It is part of our behavior. It's certainly part of our attitude. You're absolutely correct. We hate prisoners. Name a politician in the United States who can get elected on a, on a plank that says, I'm soft on crime. Because we're all about making it clear that we're hard, 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 and we want more cops, more police, more prisons. And because the 6 o'clock news every night on TV, if it bleeds, it leads, makes us believe that we're surrounded by criminals, that they're probably all black and brown, that they're all out to get us, and if somebody doesn't stand between us and chaos, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. Those attitudes make it possible for states to look their budgets in the face, understand how much they're cheating their students and in institutions of higher education and still say, no, we're going to invest in the prisons. Something's got to change, and I'm suggesting that the way to do it is at least carry out the educational mission that we can't often do in communities, begin with that in the school, have the folk come out and transform the nature of education in the community and see if that doesn't get us someplace. Thank you for your comment. Bonfam, je vous en prie. <laughs> I thought you wanted to speak. <laughs> uh, I'm going to call you Dr. Love. <laughs> because as a black... Hmm, full of love. Today I was with the Police Athletic League and they have a juvenile system for young men of color, black and Latino. Uh, I was with them today to try to get an opportunity for them to be able to be a resource for a program called Call to Justice. A program based upon what you said about looking at the ability to speak with young men and young women in middle and high school about the understanding of 
where their behavior might lead to. To give them an understanding of how they should behave in school and when they're out of school. And uh, a part of the program is looking at how do we take a look at our teachers to try to, try to help them to understand that the youth emotional trigger triggers <clears throat> lies in different ways. And when that young man or young woman come into class, that they bring in these different issues. And it's a question of how does the teacher handle that? The reason why I'm getting up today is because of the bar. Um, and one of the part of the program is more of taking a look at how do we create a partnership like that? To be able to bring that in the sense of not that, but these men who have graduated with that experience to bring an awareness to different groups or different organization that has a juvenile system within their organization or within the schools that has a large police presence to be able to bring that awareness to you to say, hey, this is who I am, this is my experience, this is my knowledge, but this is what I am doing to get beyond that. And so I'll, you know, I'm hoping that at a different time we could speak on different levels of what we could do, but I'm just trying to see how can we, as you're saying, in the sense of education, bring more awareness not to, in the understanding of behavior modification? A couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'd love to meet with you. I've got a lot of graduates who would be really happy to be engaged at that level in a program that is trying to really do something to transform the options that ch kids perceive themselves as having. But the other part that's really interesting, NPR broadcasts six weeks ago talking about the high rates of expulsions from the schools for black and Latino students pointed out that there is no school of education in the United States, no graduate school of education that actually teaches a course in classroom management. It's curriculum, it's leadership, it's research, but actually what do you do when you got a knucklehead? <clears throat> I mean, I don't want, let's not play this down. I've been a high school teacher and I've been a grammar school teacher and there are moments when it's like, oh my God. <clears throat> Can I go home now? <laughs> and you, know, you really want to know, what in fact am I supposed to do? And that it basically left to the teacher to figure it out. I, I do not want to stigmatize educators as being the source of this problem. I think they're in a system that gives them very little wiggle room. And it's like, OK, you can have your kids act out. Of course, you won't have a job next year. Or what we've got for you is just, just get rid of them. We'll, we'll, we'll handle them for you. Somewhere in the middle of that, Somewhere in the center of that, there's got to be a way in which we say, what does the research tell us about the best way to manage the kinds of inner city classrooms that many people in this room are dealing with? How do we do that? What do we do with young black men who are coming to us, having seen what's going on in Ferguson, having understood what happened with the Eric Garner case, and who are looking at you like, OK, what do you got for me? What indeed? What indeed? And you're right, waiting until they've done 15 years. <clears throat> Remember the guy who started out speaking, said, I saw BPI at Eastern 15 years ago. The good Anthony Graves has still got some time to do. He didn't get out at the point that he graduated. He's still going to be there for a while. So those folks are real clear about what life on the inside is like. Translating that into something <clears throat> that young people have the capacity to hear and act upon, I think that's still something that we've all got to work on. Because the scared straight programs never worked. They just convinced kids, I can do this. And all y'all who've seen the young men on the muscle, like, oh man, you know, that's a pump. I could do this, I could do time, you know, my brother. And then they talk about all the folk in the family who've done it, taught them how to do it well, and they're ready. <laughs> I mean, of all, the things have of all the things to have taught somebody, I can do prison. Mm. Mm. Yes, I I I'm completely with you on that. But thinking that institutions like this have a clear role to play. Are we doing the research? Have we figured out how to translate that into what we train teachers to do in the classroom? And do we put it in effective ways in the classes that we're asked to manage? That, I think, is the other half of this challenge. It has less to do with the guys on the inside and everything to do with us who are on the outside. Good point. 